Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Greetings, welcome, Assalamu Alaikum. My name is Sakib. I am the founder and director of the Hikma project. In today's episode, we'll be talking to Dr. Hani Ibrahim. Before we do that, just a few announcements. Firstly, we are running a journaling circle on the secrets of divine love by Helva. And inshallah, we'll be inviting some guest speakers to that circle as well. There are more details on the website, so feel free to join that. We'll also be launching a study circle on Ibn Arabi with Dr. Hadi Ibrahim. So more details uh, will be posted on the website. Please do join as a member. Uh, the website address is www.thehikmaproject.com and the podcasts are all free so you can go to subscribe and go to your favorite podcasting platform i normally use google and listen to all the podcasts for free uh, there's a paid members version your support is always appreciated which gives you access to the posts uh, on the website which has things like the transcript and any accompanying material and um, and then obviously you can sign up for any circles uh, or courses. So, Dr. Hani Ibrahim is a Gnostic, firstly. I thoroughly enjoyed the Sohbah with him. Uh, he is also uh, a professor at the University of Calgary and Mount Royal, Canada. Uh, and he specializes in Arabic Sufi literature, Islamic art and architecture and Ibn Arabi. Um, I won't give too much away. We had a very fruitful conversation and uh, we discussed the subtle nuances of the Akbarian metaphysics and a link to his thesis and a paper and his YouTube talk is on the website. Um, and uh, I'd really welcome you to join this study circle, which we, inshallah will be starting soon. Again, more details will be published on the website um, if you're uh, if you find yourself resonating with uh, his his um, his teachings on on Ibn Arabi. So, without further ado, here's the podcast. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Sidi oh. Ibrahim. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. It's wonderful to have you with us today on the Hikmah Project Thank podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. So can you just begin by telling us a bit about your background and how you got interested in Ibn Arabi, how you found out and how what the opening was with him? Okay. Uh... I started uh, and began uh, reading on uh, Sufism. I was watching the TV uh, in Egypt uh, back in, in 1986 or 87. And they were discussing the uh, epistle of Imam al-Qushiri, Rasayl al-Qushiri. So I got really interested in it. And uh, it was the first book which I bought uh, in Sufism. Uh, and I began reading it, and uh, prior to that, I had uh, my grandmother had uh, recently passed away, and I had some uh, spiritual experiences. And when I began reading uh, the epistle of Imam al-Qashiri, uh, many meanings which had occurred to me during that uh, spiritual experience after the passing of my grandmother, I began relating it and, and understanding the themes and terms and uh, uh, ex experiences which were mentioned in the Rasal uh, al And then I began reading on uh, Sufism and especially the books of Imam al Ghazali. Uh, of course, I've been reading about what Ibn Taymiyyah and other scholars have been criticizing and writing about uh, Sheikh Muhyiddin. 
And I honestly, I was afraid to approach him. But uh, when I uh, finished my studies in England in 1992, I finished uh, a master's degree in Islamic architecture. I returned to Egypt and I was doing some renovations in Al Azhar uh, Mosque as an architect. And passing uh, in Al Azhar district, there was uh, a publisher known uh, as the Al Gindi or Al Jindi publishers who had some small rasail uh, uh, or epistles written by Sheikh Mohiddi. So I began uh, collecting them with a bit of cautious, you know, what has been said about Sheikh Mohiddi. And what made me interested in uh, the Sheikh, I read a book by Sheikh Abdul Halim Mahmoud, the Sheikh of Al Azhar, in his book uh, on Sheikh Abu Madian Al Ghawth. He wrote a biography on Sheikh Abu Madian Al Ghawth, and in it he mentioned a couple of uh, things on, Sh- on Sidi Muhyiddin. So I said, no, honestly, uh, this could not be a heretic, <laughs> it's something else. So I began reading these small epistles, and I got interested in Sheikh Muhyiddin in 19. Uh, 92. This was the uh, beginnings. And the more I read into him and uh, with the spiritual experiences that uh, I uh, had, uh, I began relating and understanding. Uh, as they say, Sheikh Muhyiddin, the Shiyu, uh, give spiritual ex- uh, education to the Murids. Yani a Shiyukh Rabbi al Muridin, the spiritual seekers. But the Sheikh Muhyiddin, Rabbi al Arifin, is a Sheikh of the Arifuna Billah, he's a Sheikh of the Gnostics. Mm-hmm. So a person cannot just open a book by Sidi Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, read and say, Oh, yeah, and, and he, he understands. This is, you have to experience uh, what on the spiritual path, particular openings, and when you read, in the writings of Sheikh Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, you can relate and understand. So he explains the spiritual experiences. Uh, if a person does not have a, a live sheikh, a live sheikh. Also, uh, Sidi Muhyiddin said, Man lam yashrab mashrabna, who has not tasted what we have tasted, tuharram alayhi qira'at kutubina. It's forbidden for that person to read our books. Because as, as the Shiuk said, people might misunderstand what he's trying to say. And this happened to Ibn Taymiyyah when he criticized uh, Sidi Muhyiddin. Uh, he says uh, people who say or believe in the oneness of being, uh, people are who, uh, who are um, heretics because they do not differentiate between the creator and the creation. Sheikh Muhyiddin never said this. The Muhyiddin never said uh, that, uh, that there is the creator and there is creation. Creation is merely a manifestation of the attributes of God. So when a person witnesses creation, that person, he or she, witness God through his attributes. Okay? Mm. So he is speaking about something else. So a person has to have a sheikh, has to have a guide and uh, tread on this uh, path. So understanding Sidi Muhyiddin, a person must have uh, spiritual openings, experiences, and uh, to be a Arif Billah. So he is a trainer, uh, a sheikh of the Arifuna Billah. Uh, as for the path, uh, I, ha- I took uh, the uh, path of Sidi Ahmad al-Badawi in Tanta. Uh, and then after that, I went to Mecca where I worked in the uh, University of King Abdul Aziz in Jeddah, where uh, I met uh, a Tijani Sheikh. His name is uh, Sheikh Ahmed Idris. And he was a student of uh, the well known Sheikh Sidi Ibrahim Niyas al Kawlakhi. And during that time in Mecca, I uh, uh, accompanied the Sheikh and he gave me special. Adi'iyah uh, to recite, and Alhamdulillah, Allah bestowed on me uh, yeah, His uh, 
معرفه ان انسايد بحر من الحمد لله ان مك الحمد لله wow that's uh, beautiful how would you summarize sheikh muhiddin's perspective sheikh sidi muhiddin he speaks on the oneness of god tawhid ashhadu anna la ilaha illallah i bear witness that's why uh, the the hadith of the angel gabriel which i stress on is the foundation of the religion of god and this i i tell my students there are three dimensions in this religion the basic the foundation the rituals it's about actions and this is the level of islam submission you submit to god willingly and when a person makes an effort juhd ijtihad as the prophet said the major jihad al jihad al akbar on the nafs on the soul people then transcend to the second dimension and that is iman as the quran states qalat al a'rab amanna okay so you cannot say i am a believer until iman or faith enters the heart so this is the higher second dimension of iman and then a person makes an effort juhd ijtihad on his or herself to transcend to the third and highest level and this is the level of ihsan the level of ihsan as the prophet muhammad defined it is to worship god as if you see him so seeing is a matter of the the heart as in the quran ma kadhaba al fuad ma ra'a what it has saw so seeing is witnessing god through the senses and the heart is the element that witnesses god as the prophet muhammad said and then the lower uh, level he says and ta'bud allah ka annaka tara you worship god as if you see him if you uh, uh, cannot see him this is the level the lower level of ihsan know that god sees you this is the level of muraqaba so if a person cannot attain this level of seeing witnessing god the first pillar of islam ashhadu anna la ilaha illallah i witness that's why the prophet muhammad said qulu la ilaha illallah to just say la ilaha illallah but a person has for a person to attain the level of witnessing god a person has to fulfill islam the obligations of islam then fulfill the obligations of iman and then fulfill the obligations of ihsan so sidi muhyiddin al arabi addresses for example in his book al fatuhat al makkiyah these three, three different levels of of islam also a person has to be <coughs> uh, i i cannot say a scholar but someone who is founded and grounded in islamic jurisprudence uh, quranic hermeneutics tafsir uh, grammar uh, poetry in order to to Uh, fu- uh, fully appreciate the writings of Sheikh Muhyiddin ibn Arabi hmm. also Sheikh Abdul Wahab al-Sha'rani the famous uh, Sufi Egyptian scholar Sheikh Abdul Sha'rani said that uh, Sheikh Muhyiddin ibn Arabi excelled in every field of the religious sciences he is an imam and everyone else is a follower of him yeah. Yeah. so just before we continue with some more questions just going back to the idea of needing a sheikh and a guide uh, a living sheikh uh, and having that taste that zulk and those aspects of marifa um uh, is there a reason sheikh ibn arabi did not found a lineage himself uh, i mean his metaphysics is very universal very rooted in the quran um was he opposed to that form of um uh, to sabwa for spirituality um and did he have a line of spiritual himma which he i know amir abdul qadir jazairi i i believe clay, lays claim to that and obviously it's it's quite uh, evident in his sermons and in his books his works how he's deeply influenced and spiritually uh in tune with the great sheikh so could you say something about that Uh, in the sufi path <coughs> excuse me 
the Quran says and defines the Sufi path. Allah says in the Quran, Allahu yajtabi ilayhi man yasha wa yahdi ilayhi man yunib. So there are two paths to God. One is those who are al-mujtabun, who have been chosen, and you can tr translate ijtiba as majdub or snatched. So God snatches or brings to himself whomever he wishes. Allahu yajtabi ilayhi man yasha wa yahdi ilayhi man yunib, and guides to himself those who repent and seek him. So there are two paths. The first is, is known as the majdu or the, mut, the mutaraqi, a person who uh, has, is transcending. Well, uh, uh, this is yahdi ilayhi min ash who transcends, goes upwards. Well, mutadalli al majdu who was snatched and reaches the hadra, witnesses God, and then descends back to be among the people. So Sidi Muhyiddin Arabi, he mentioned the many shiukh, uh, who benefited him in the Sufi path, but he mentions that Sidi Abu Madian al ghaw was his main sheikh, even though he did not meet him in person. But uh, I believe that Sidi Abu Madian al ghaw was his spiritual sheikh. Uh, and this is known as the Tarbiya uh, al similar to what happened to Uwais al Qarani of Yemen which the Prophet gave spiritual education and they have not met. So a person can have a spiritual sheikh who can guide him. This was my first experience where I had uh, Sidi Ahmad al-Badawi of Tanta. He was my first spiritual sheikh. But I did not understand. I, I saw him in many visions, but uh, I didn't understand. For example, one of the main visions I saw him uh, holding a mirror in front of my face and I saw a reflection of, my, of myself and he said and he pointed this is Allah I didn't understand so when I took the tariqat I had a living sheikh this living sheikh when he gave me a word according to the uh, sheikh Ibrahim Niyas is known as word at tarbiya the sheikh Sidi Ahmad uh, Idris he used to he gave me this word uh, and used to ask me questions. But I didn't know until uh, I asked him one question in the poetry at the end of uh, uh, Sheikh Abdullah al-Ansari, Manazil uh, al that at the end it says, ما وحد الواحد من واحد. No one made Tawheed except the one. ما وحد الواحد من واحد. Is So everyone who is attempting to make Tawheed of God, he is uh, incorrect. Okay? Tawheed of The one who makes Tawheed and the oneness of God is God himself. And when I ask him the meaning of this, he says, this is a hijab. It's veiled. So people, if they think they have reached and attained witnessing God and they uh, uh, believe that they themselves are the witnesses of God, this is still a veil. Mm -hmm. Because in reality, it's only him who witnesses himself. If a person still sees himself, that's why they call it it's fana, annihilation, or uh, uh, effa uh, uh, effacement. If a person still thinks that he is witnessing God, that person is still in a veil. It's only God who witnesses God through the Muhammadian light. So speaking of that, the term Wahdatul Wujud is often attributed to uh, Sheikh Ibn al-Arabi and the consensus is he doesn't use that term himself, but you did mention, I believe in one of your talks, that he uses the term Wahda Fil Wujud. Yes. Yes. Could you just expand on that? Where does he use that? And what is his understanding of that term? He mentions this and uh, I met Sheikh Mahmoud Al-Ghurab uh, in Egypt and he mentions 
uh, this in one of his books. And I uh, referenced him in my uh, thesis and in my book, which is coming out. See, the Muhammad Arabi, he never mentions Wahdat al Wujud, but he mentions Al Wahda fi Al Wujud, oneness in being. Why? Because he affirms creation and at the same time affirms the creator. So, Wahdat al Wujud can be can be understood as, as Ibn Taymiyyah and other peoples understood it. There is no differentiation between the creator God and his creation. Okay, but wahda fi al wujud in it, it affirms both the creator and the creation. And uh, I think this is the uh, difference in what people understood. That's why when people mention, for example, in uh, the writings, uh, to be one with God or union with God. This is incorrect because as a Sidi Muhammad did in Arabi, he said there is no union and there is no hulul, there is no incarnation. He said, Man qala bil hulul fahuwa ma'lul. Whoever says or claims incarnation, he is sick, fahuwa ma'lul. Wa man qala bil ittihad, whoever says union, fahuwa aqrabu ila al-ilhad. And he explains why. If there is incarnation, then God comes into it, incarnates in. If he's the creator of space and time, how can he incarnate in something? Okay. That's why he said, فَهُوَ مَعْلُولُ مَنْ قَالَ بِالْحُلُولُ فَهُوَ مَعْلُولُ A person is sick. وَمَنْ قَالَ بِالْإِتْتِحَادِ فَهُوَ أَقْرَبُ إِلْحَادِ He's close to heresy. Why? Because there is only one, and that is him, God. There are new two entities which unite with each other. So, Al-Fatih, or al-wusul, or al-mushahada, is a person when he or she realizes that nothing exists in reality except him, God. That's why al-hallaj, when he uttered, he said, ana al-haq. He is correct. But Sidi Muhyiddin said that al-hallaj uh, uttered this statement when he was in a state of fana annihilation. So al-kamal, perfection, Al-Baqa, and this is the station of the Prophet Muhammad, he never said an al-haq. In some hadith, he said, yes, uh, Allahu haq, wal malaika haq, wal akhiratu haq, wal rasul haq. But he never said an al-haq, I am. Okay. So a person should follow the path of the Prophet Muhammad and Sidi Muhyiddin in Arabi adheres strictly to sharia. And uh, this is the path which he sticks to, and this is what the Quran says. It is uh, the Prophet, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ Say, if you claim that you love God, follow me. يُحْبِبُكُمُ الله. Follow me, God will bestow his love on you. So, the only path in reaching fatah, in reaching and realizing shahada, is by following the Prophet Muhammad step by step. That's why many people misunderstood Sidi Muhyiddin ibn Arabi uh, as saying that all religion, such as, uh, for example, the, the perennialist philosophy, that all paths lead to one thing, and that is Allah, or this is incorrect. They misunderstood Sheikh uh, Muhyiddin ibn Arabi. Sidi Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, he's speaking from the witnessing of the Arif Billah, the Gnostic. The Gnostic witnesses God in everything. He or she witnesses God in everything, even in other forms of religion. Mm. But God chose this path, the path of the Prophet Muhammad, for a person, a Muslim. That's why he said, uh, whoever chooses another religion other than Islam, this will not be accepted from that person. So the path of reaching this re realization is through the Prophet Muhammad, through the path. And this was uh, the path of Sidi Muhyiddin. Also, Sidi Muhyiddin has uh, lineage, and alhamdulillah, I have also lineage, silsila going back to Sheikh Muhyiddin from uh, one of my shiuch, Sheikh, Sheikh Mustafa al-Nadawi of Egypt, and he took his silsila from Sheikh Abu al-Hassan al-Nadawi al-Hassan. So there is 
uh, a link, a lineage going back to the silsila at tariqa al akbariya from this path. And I have it also tabarrukan uh, from uh, the Sheikh Sidi um, uh, Mustafa al Nadir. Beautiful. So, Sidi, could you, uh, while we're on this uh, topic of uh, Sharia, could you say a bit more about the Akbarian school of legal perspective? Because I know from having briefly studied certain parts of the Futuhat, mainly the chapter on fasting in Ramadan, I normally do, is how he cites different perspectives and never saying one is right or wrong, but then he gives his perspective. And also in your talk, you mentioned how he uses Kash as a means of verifying a hadith. Um, so yes. what what is the Akbarian school of uh, law, if you like? What is his legal perspective? Sidi Muhyiddin, he began following the Maliki uh, school of jurisprudence. Then as he matured spiritually, uh, he began uh, seeing the different paths. Uh, and he, I believe he reached the level of al-ijtihad al-mutlaq, similar to what Imam al-Ghazali reached. So in the uh, fiqh, in the school of jurisprudence, when he reached the level of ijtihad in the Maliki school, he left and excelled by understanding sharia. And also this is mentioned in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, if you are God-fearing, if you are pious, God himself will teach you. Uh, for example, in the story of Moses and Al-Khidr, in the Quran, it teaches the three levels of annihilation. The first level, al fana al-af'al, annihilation in actions, and this means a person, when he or she are on the path of this self-realization that nothing exists but God, the first is the level of annihilation of in actions. This means a person witnesses the actions, that they're not the actions of creation, but the actions of God. Okay? وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ you threw and you threw not, it was only God who threw. So when a person on the path, this path realizes this level, then they have reached the state of annihilation in the actions, and they see the actions of God. And this when Sayyidina al-Khidr told Moses, Moses asked him when, them, when he broke the ship, he said, and he, he, he asked him, uh, uh, I wanted to make it uh, faulty. Why did he say I wanted? So when he broke the ship, he did not see himself breaking it, but it was the action of God that who was breaking the ship. Mm. And then when he killed the boy, he said, We wanted. So this is the second level of annihilation in the attributes, fanat fi as-sifat. Okay? So, qatiluhum yu'adhibuhum allahu bi'aytukum. The verse on uh, the Quran, fight them, God will uh, torture or torment them by through your hands. This is fanat fi as-sifat. And then finally, when he built the wall, he said, arada rabbuka an yablugha ashuddahma. God wanted. This is fanat. In the essence. So this is the three levels of annihilation. I did not do it on my own accord. So this is the path on reaching uh, annihilation and witnessing God. It is not you, it is only Him. So this is how Sidi Muhyiddin uh, receives his knowledge from God direct. Uh, and and uh, Sayyidina al-Khidr in the uh, Surah al-Kah, uh, Allah says, Abdan aytaynahu rahmatan min indina wa allamnahu min ladunna ilma. This is ilm ladun. So this is open for everyone as, and the condition is following the Sharia. That's why you cannot say, 
عارف بالله or a muhsin who has reached or attained this stage does not follow or observe sharia. How can a person not follow the Prophet and observe sharia and attain such a level? It has to be through sharia, has to be through the path of the Prophet Muhammad. That's why Sidi Muhyiddin, he reached al-ijtihad uh, al-mutlaq and he, may, he has his own fiqh. And also Sheikh Mahmoud al rab he gathered the different perspectives and uh, uh, judicial opinions of Sheikh Muhyiddin in one of his books, Al-Fiqh in the Shaykh Al-Akbar, Jurisprudence According to uh, Al-Shaykh Al-Akbar. Uh, that is why Sidi Muhyiddin Arabi, I, I, I tell my uh, colleagues and uh, friends, uh, Sidi Muhyiddin, he's an imam. Everyone else is a follower of Sidi Muhyiddin in Ma'rifa Billah. So you correct, a person corrects his or her understanding or spiritual openings according to what Sheikh Muhyiddin said, not the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Subhanallah. Uh, could you say, I know you've done a lot of work around um, the uh, love the teachings of love in uh, Sheikh Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi. Um, before we dive into uh, the his teachings, let's just go to the words uh, Sheikh Ibn Arabi uses. Could you, does he use the word ishq? I, I know there's a Quranic word hub. In kuntum tuhibbun Allah fattabi'uni yuhbibkumullah. So the word hub. And in your video, YouTube video on love in the teachings of Ibn Arabi, you cite the um, uh, two Quranic verses and three ahadith, uh, which are uh, central to uh, uh, Sheikh Ibn Arabi's teachings, which I would recommend our listeners to watch if they haven't done so already. So, and also in the Fasus, he uses the word shahwa in a positive connotation, um, which uh, again, for many readers would be quite controversial because uh, of the way it gets translated. Um, mm. And so could you elaborate on these different uh, terms and what they mean mm. in the school of Ibn Arabi? Sheikh Muhyiddin, as I said, uh, he adheres strictly to Sharia. So he says, Aishq, he does not use the word Aishq. Uh, however, uh, Aishq, the word Aishq is usually used by uh, Persian Sufis such as Rumi and, uh, and others. But Sidi Muhyiddin, he uses the Quranic words. For example, he says, even though Ishq is not a, a Quranic term, its meaning is used in uh, the Quran, for example, and he references uh, Zulaikha when she loved Joseph. He said, Qad hubba. So he used the word Shagaf, resembles the word Ishq. That his love engulfed, encapsulated her heart. Mm. Uh, as I said, he keeps on referencing the Quran and the Hadith. So if a person understands the tafsir, the Quranic word, uh, words, the terms, and also the Hadith, he draws from every uh, uh, path from the Quran, from the poetry from the etymological root of every word. For example, he says, he, uh, it begins uh, uh, by a whim, al-hawa. The Prophet Muhammad mentions this hawa, but in a, negative, in a positive sense, where, even though it's used negatively in the Quran in a negative sense, hawa is a whim. And it can mean, in the Arabic term, hawa yahwa, or Yahwi from something above to a lower state. That's why you say falling in love. A person falls in love. So it begins by a whim. And then love, when it, uh, if you, uh, a person loves something purely, he uses and explains the word hub. Mean, one of the meanings of it is a seed. So it begins, you plant a small seed in the heart, and then it becomes a big tree and grows step by step until it reaches the level of ishq or engulfing the heart by uh, the convolvulus plant when it wraps itself around the, uh, uh, the binding, weed, uh, binding weed. And this is a term also which is used in the Quran. And this is the word khalil. That's why Allah chose 
uh, named the Prophet Abraham as Khalilullah. Mm. Also, the Prophet Muhammad, when he mentions Abu Bakr, he also said that the Prophet Muhammad, uh, uh, he, he is his Khalil. But the Prophet uh, Muhammad said himself, he is the Khalil al-Rahman. Mm. So the highest level of, of, of uh, love or, or ishq, you can say it, is al khulla that's why the Prophet Muhammad said in the hadith, المرء على دين خليلي فلينظر أحدكم من يخال A person is on the terms or literally the religion of his very closest, intimate friend. Mm-hmm. So you have to choose wisely whom you befriend. Mm-hmm. And so the, the, the term shahwa, the Quranic verse, yes. have you not seen the person who has taken for his God, his Hawa. Yes. On knowledge. Yes. That's why the most important thing here is the intention. What is your intention? Is your intention Allah? Is your intention paradise? Is your intention to reach Qutubaniya? Is your intention to reach Fath itself opening? Is your intention to be called a wali or alif billah? What is your intention? That's why the Prophet Muhammad said, Whatever you do, it depends on your own intention, what you intend. That's why intention and niya is very, very important. You have to keep, uh, purify your intention. Hmm. Is it Allah you want or is it paradise? You choose. Is it Allah or Fath even? And this is the last hurdle before reaching opening or Fath. You want me or you want Fath? Mm. That's why you have to, uh, the Sufi so it's called Takhalli. You have to leave everything. Leave everything. You only want Allah. That's why it is narrated that Allah said that all people ask from me. They want something from me. Except Abu Yazid. He wanted me only. (laughs) That's why your goal is Allah. And I keep criticizing them. Oh, when they mention, for example, the hadith of Imam Tirmidhi, that the martyrs will have 70 holies. What is 70 holies compared to God, Allah? If you reached Allah, you have reached and attained everything. If you have missed Allah, you have missed everything. So what mm-hmm. is the goal here for Muslims? That's why I said Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, all rituals in Islam are paths. They are corridors to that goal. Mm-hmm. They are not an end to themselves. Paradise is not the goal itself. Paradise is a means to witness God. <laughs> it mm-hmm. is not an end in itself. And that's why in the Quran also the verse says, and everything ends to your God, to God, to your Lord. So this is the goal. Hmm. Also, I uh, tell my students the, when they people say, oh, uh, they attack and critique Sufis. In Sharia, there is no such a word as tasawf or Sufi. And I keep telling them this. But this is the level or ulum al-ihsan, the science of ihsan or benevolence or good doing. And I tell them, have you ever heard when a person is asked, are you a Muslim? He says, I'm a Muslim. If he's asked, are you a mu'min? Uh, he says, yes, I'm a, mu'min. Uh, I'm a mu'min, with a difference of opinion between the Shafi'iyya and the <laughs> Ahnaf. Okay? But have you ever heard someone say, I'm a muhsin? No one says, I'm a muhsin. So this term has been attached and ascribed to them. No one said I'm a muhsin. And only in the Quran, God says, but from the Muslimun, والمحسن, he only loves the benevolent. إنه يحب المحسنين. إن الله مع الذين اتقوا, he is with the God-fearing and pious. والذين هم محسنون. So this is a special ma'iyya. This is a, uh, he is uh, with them in a special. Yes, uh, God is with everyone, okay? With all of his creation. But this is a special uh, ma'iyya. The people who are good, uh, good doers or the muhsinun. 
And that's why the Prophet Muhammad said, when you're asking about uh, Al-Hawa, he said, La yu'min ahadukum. And this is the second level, Al-Iman. None of you believes. I'm not talking about the Muslims, the second level. لا يؤمن أحدك none of you believes until حتى يكون هواه تبعا لما جئت به until his or her هوا or whim is according to what I have uh, delivered and that is the Quran and the Sunnah is an interpretation of the Quran so هوا here the second level a person reaches iman when he or she Desire nothing except what Allah commanded and the Prophet explained. So all this is the path of Ihsan. This is the science of Ihsan. Also, Sidi Muhyiddin, when he describes, he does not say Arif Billah. Even though the term has been used in a particular hadith, uh, when one of the companions, uh, I think uh, Haritha, he told the Prophet, "Asbahtu al-ana mu'minan haqqan." I am. I woke up a true believer now. And so the Prophet Muhammad asked them, "What you felt?" And then the end, he said, "Arafta falzam." The Prophet told him, "You now know, so adhere to this past." That's why they call him Arif. But Sidi Muhyiddin, he explained it. He said, "No, you cannot call him Arif billah because it is not a Quranic term, and you cannot." attribute the name Arif to God. He's not Arif because Ma'arif can be superficial. You can understand something from the outside, but you do not know Al-Ilm exactly of it. So there's a difference between Ma'arif and Ilm. Hmm. Ilm can be interpreted as science, but Ilm is full knowledge. That's why in the Quran, God says, uh, Surah Al-Imran, Shahid Allahu. أنه لا إله إلا هو والملائكة وأول العلم. That's why Sheikh Muhyiddin uses the word عالم بالله عالم بالله not عارف بالله. Beautiful city. Just uh, the, the term you mentioned, uh, taqwa, wakaya. Yes. Often this is a very problematic term in the way it gets translated. Or it gets misunderstood uh, as um, fear of Allah, which then has many connotations in the way it's understood in the Western or English language, um, mm-hmm. uh, which you know we don't need to go into. But could you? But I know in the Fasus, I believe in the first mm-hmm. chapter, uh, Sheikh Mohyuddin has a play on the roots wakaya in various sort of verses and lines. Could you please explain to our listeners what the word taqwa is in the school of Ibn Arabi? From the, in the school of Ibn Arabi, taqwa here, Imam Ali explained at taqwa al khawfu min al jaleel wal amal bil tanzeel, as Imam Ali explained. But here you can refer to the hadith mentioned by the Prophet Muhammad, uh, narrated when he went to pray outside on the 9th or the 15th of Sha'ban. He said, اللهم إني أعوذ بعفوك من عقوبتك وأعوذ برضاك من سخطك and then he said أعوذ بك منك لا أحصي ثناء ملك I take refuge from you to you so taqwa is taking refuge from Allah his wrath and asking God to protect you from himself. I take refuge from you to you. This is what the Prophet Muhammad said. This is the reality of taqwa. It's not who it's not you who are God fearing. God has manifested on that person and gave him this sense or feeling or feeling of God fearing. Hence, that person abides by the rulings of Sharia. It is not you. There's still duality here. If you think that you are sincere, then you are on grave danger. This is as Imam Ghazali said. All people are doomed except those who have knowledge. All knowledgeable 
uh, people are doomed except those who act with, with what they have known. وَكُلُّ الْعَامِلُونَ هَلْكَ إِلَّا الْمُخْلِصُونَ And all those who are acting by what they knew are in danger except those who are sincere. And then he said, وَالْمُخْلِصُونَ عَلَى خَطْرٍ عَظِيمٍ And those who are sincere are on grave danger. Why? Because they see themselves as sincere. That's why Sidi Abul Hassan al-Shadli, he said, you can summarize the whole of the Futuhat in a couple of words. لا ترضى عن نفسك قد. Do not be satisfied ever with yourself. Subhanallah. So the reality of taqwa, the reality is not you who are God feeling. It's what God has manifested or bestowed on that creation to take the path of taqwa. Why? Because he wants to teach you. He, he has chosen you. To be sincere. He has loved you before you loved him. Hmm. He has willed it that you will, so you can ask him. That's why I see Ahmad ibn Ajiba, he said, he did not open the gate of supplication or dua. He only opened this gate because he wants to give you. That's why the Prophet Muhammad also said, لا يغير القضاء إلا الدعاء. Faith can only be changed through dua. So dua itself is from faith. God opened that gate of dua, supplication, so you can ask God and so he can bestow and give you. There is nothing but him. Mm. There is nothing but him. So this is the school of Sidi Muhiddi. That's beautiful because often in conversations with people, I've had some recently actually, the term taqwa, the, the understanding of it, is often rooted in duality. And so yes. they, they, it's a <laughs> mental sort of fear, if you like, of a punishing God for no. you know, their, own, their own sort of shortcomings. And yeah. yeah, so I think there's a more subtler nuance than that, as, as you rightly mentioned. Mm. Um, and Sidi, so on this, uh, you mentioned um, uh, Sheikh, um, Abu Hassan al-Shadli, summarizing the uh, Futuhat. Futuhat, yes. Yeah. Could you say a bit more about the relationship of uh, uh, Sheikh um, uh, Abu Hassan al-Shadli and uh, the Akbarian school? Was he deeply steeped in it? Mm. Was he uh, learned in the Akbarian metaphysics? And uh, Also, I'd like to explain this point. Sidi Muhyiddin Arabi was not the first to speak about Tawheed hmm. or oneness of being. Tawheed, uh, you can conclude and deduce from many Quranic verses and many hadiths. Okay? So the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, well, I can mention many, many, many uh, 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 hadith, Imam Ali, and I can mention many of them. Uh, even Imam Junaid spoke about Tawheed, oneness of being, as you can say, oneness of being. So it was already that this is Tawheed, this is the realization of the first pillar of Islam. As I said, Ashhadu an la I witness. Okay, so someone who has not witnessed God, it's a false statement. That's why the Prophet Muhammad he said, Qulu la ilaha illa Allah, you just utter, say it, you will uh, be successful. But only few who realize it, only few who God gives them and bestows on them this gift so they can witness and realize. Why? Because he wants them to realize this. So this is not for everyone. Okay? Also, God can uh, take someone and give him, bestows this ma'rifah, uh, and he can keep it for that person. Others, God can give them permission to guide others in attaining this path. So there's a Arif Billah or Alim Billah who has reached this uh, witnessing and Ma'rifa, okay? But God did not give him permission to guide others. Okay? Sayyid Abul Hassan al Shazli, when he reached this and attained it, he did not want to go out from his khulwa. So God threatened him. He said, Go out and teach uh, people, or I will 
take everything which I have bestowed on you. Why? Because he wanted him to teach others. Okay. Also, they say that uh, the Gnostics know each other. So a person who has or she has tasted this marifa, okay, and speaks about it, those who have experienced a similar experience understand who's truthful and who's not. Okay, so a person can speak about marif. You have not experienced it. How can you describe it? Okay, so you're just reading. That's why al yaqeen has three levels. There is, in, and these are mentioned in the Quran. There is ilm al yaqeen the knowledge of certitude. There is ayn al yaqeen vision of certitude. And there is haq al yaqeen reality of certitude. Similar. So you can see there's also a tripartite relation similar to the states of annihilation. Okay, and then you can read the, the number three. Why the Prophet Muhammad, in his prayer, he mentions three times, Subhan Rabbi al three times, and then he has to Subhan Rabbi al Why the three? The three levels of annihilation, the three levels of certitude. So people who read about Sheikh Muhammad or read about have only knowledge on of certitude. They have not witnessed it and they have not realized it in reality. Uh, so Sheikh Abul Hassan al-Shazli, Sidi Ahmad al-Badawi, Sidi Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, Sidi Ahmad al rafai all these poles of uh, the Sufi paths have reached such stages. Like I, uh, when I gave an, an example, they are like different flowers, different scents, different shapes and colors. Why? Because people have different tastes. For example, someone may, may like, uh, the, uh, is attracted, and God wanted the person to come to this, the tariqa shadaliyya, because, for example, he or she love reading Awrad and Ahzab. Okay? Uh, tariqa of Sidi Ahmad al-Badawi is mainly on about jazb, dhikr, mentioning God and jazb. Okay? So these paths are different gates, okay, to reaching one thing. And that is Allah. So, and I keep also, I, I tell also my students, these paths and these aqtab, these poles, are like doors, but different doors, okay? Different appearances that lead to the same thing, okay? I'm speaking about Islam. I'm speaking about Sharia. I'm not speaking about Buddhism or Hinduism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the religion of Islam, the path of the Prophet Muhammad. Okay, so uh, even though Sidi Muhyiddin al Arabi he was contemporary to Sheikh Abul Hassan al Shazli, Sheikh Abul Abbas al Mursi, Sidi Ahmad al Badawi, and uh, Sidi Ibrahim al Suqi, uh, he mentioned only Sidi Abdul Qadir al Jilani, okay, in, the, uh, in, in his writings, and mentioned many, of course, of the Moroccan uh, awliya and the Moroccan arifin. For example, in his, in his book, Risalat uh, Ruhul Al-Qudus, and also in uh, the Futuhat. So they usually differentiated between, between Eastern Sufism and Western Sufism. So you can say Sidi Muhammad was part of the Western Sufism in Morocco, in the North Africa, and in Andalusia. Okay, so because he was raised and grounded in, in, in this Sufis. That's why maybe he, he did not mention the Eastern uh, uh, Sufis or Awliya. And just on this topic of Wahda uh, Fil Wajud, is uh, I, I don't know if you have looked into this, um, but it would be wonderful if you can offer the explanation. In the Naqshbandi path, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Sirhindi in his Maktubat, mm. I believe. Um, <laughs> Has uh, has firstly deep reverence for the Sheikh Al Akbar, but then also has a difference of opinion where he says uh, he advocates the Wahda to Wahda uh, Wahda to Wahda fil Shahud, and he says this is a Shahudi, wahda shahudi. <laughs> perspective as opposed to Wujudi. But that obviously uh, is not bearing in mind what you've just said of Wahda Wahda yes. fil Al Wujud. Could you explain yes. this this difference? Was it based on a misunderstanding then? Yeah. The, the, the understanding. I cannot say Sidi Sheikh uh, Sarhandi uh, was no misunderstood. No, mm -hmm. it's a level on the path. I see. 
So, for example, when the Arif Billah or the Alim Billah is in a state of annihilation, effacing, uh, and witnessing God. So who is witnessing? He thinks, still thinks that he is witnessing. Mm. So this is a level. Oh, I am the Gnostic. I am the Arif Billah who is witnessing God. Mm. But the higher level, you do not see yourself. You efface yourself. And this is fana al fana, the annihilation of your annihilation. And this is called the baqa. That's why this is the highest of tamkeen. So Sheikh mm. uh, Sarahani, when he said, wahda fi shuhud, he's correct. But it is a lesser level than the higher level of fana al fana. Who's witnessing? Is it you or God? Shahid Allahu annahu la ilaha illahu. It's him who's witnessing himself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and then the city, can you mention in within this context, and I think Rumi has a lot to say around this, the connection between human love and divine love. So many people yes. will not understand love had they not tasted mm. human love. But exactly. at the same time, where there is divine eminence and transcendence, surely <laughs> the only reason we know human love is because there is divine love. And yes. ultimately, although we think we are loving, uh, yeah. It, it is really where do you is there a distinction can you draw the distinction between what we call human love and divine love yeah. and maybe I should just add uh, the uh, the la ilaha illallah the Ibn Arabi way of also looking at this is to say yeah. that people are worshipping Allah whether they are aware of it or not yes so, exactly. so, so Majnoon when he talks about Layla ultimately yes. he's seeing the face of the beloved uh, yes. And so, uh, what? H- how do you make this distinction between human and divine? Or is okay, there there's no, no distinction? distinction? There's no okay, distinction. There's no distinction. <laughs> yeah, 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 it appears. It's an illusion. Mm-hmm. It's like in the, the Hindu concept of Maya. It's Maya. You think that you are a loving God, or there's a human. Every emotion in creation is merely a manifestation of the divine names of God. So the majority of people are veiled. God is is never veiled. God is not veiled. People are veiled from witnessing him. That's why the Sufis, they call it Hadra. You keep mentioning God until you Witness God, the veils on your heart are lifted to witness Him. Okay? And as it's in reality, it's Him who is witnessing Himself. So He's lifting the veils on your heart to witness Himself on you. Hmm. <laughs> That's why Imam Ali said, Law hijabu Imam Ali said, If the veils are lifted, my certitude will not increase. Why? And so in reality, there is no veils. You are veiling yourselves by yourselves. Mm. So this is the reality. So human love, affection, even between animals, every form of love that you see is merely a manifestation of God. Mm. The manifestation of the divine love of God. Because in reality, nothing exists except him. So he is the lover. He is the beloved. And he is the feeling the feelings of the essence of love itself. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. So could you tell us about your new book, Love in the Teachings of mm-hmm. Ibn Arabi? Yes, uh, it's the, uh, my, uh, P, my MA, I, my uh, dissertation. I did it uh, at the University of Lethbridge where I uh, analyzed the chapter of love in the Futuhat al makkiyah chapter one. 78. So my focus was on this chapter only. Then my PhD, I uh, made a, a bigger survey, like I uh, wrote from the Fusus Al Hikam. I chose Fas Hikma Muhammadiyya, and I explained uh, the concept of, of love in it, why God chose the Prophet Muhammad to be his most beloved. Okay, so I, I chose this first from Sus Hikam, and I also expanded on the chapter of the Futuhat 178 uh, and also other books. So 
My book is, an, is the culmination of my MA, my PhD uh, in uh, this book. SubhanAllah. And just on the fuss of Muhammadiyah in the Fasus, the hadith about um, uh, women, perfume and prayer. Could you mm. please tell us about that and uh, explain it in yeah. Arabi's commentary or perspective Excellent. on that? Yes. Sidi Muhyiddin, he explained, he said, the hadith, what did the hadith say? The hadith said, Hubbiba ilayya. So, the, these things were, were, were made beloved to me. So this means he, the Prophet Muhammad never chose it to love it, but they were made beloved to him. Why God? Because he said, some people say, the greatest manifestation uh, is in the form of the female. Why? Because it is the entity of perfect manifestation of the beautiful names, al-asma' al-jamaliyya. So, the, every female, that's why God created, وَمِن كُلِّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقْنَا زَوْجَيْنِ From everything we made, two things, entities, a, a, a male and a female. So the male here is the perfect manifestation of the majestical names, al-asma' al jalaliyya and females are the perfect manifestation of al-asma al-jamaliyya, beautiful. So when these two creations uh, mate, interact, yantuj anhum anhum al khalq, creation is made from the mating of these two names, creation. Okay. So creation comes out of love through these two names, the Al-Asma' Al-Jamaliya and Al-Asma' Al-Jalaliya. So this is, that, that is why these two things, perfect manifestation of the beautiful names in the form of the feminine and also a perfume, something beautiful. These are manifestations of beauty. Also the Prophet Muhammad, is the perfect manifestation of al-asma al-jamaliyya. Why people speak about the majesty or the uh, al-jalal of the Prophet Muhammad? It is the jalal of his most perfect and eminent beauty jamal. It's similar when you eat something very sweet, it burns you. <laughs> so... The Prophet Muhammad, his jalal is merely a, the complete perfection of the manifestation of beauty. Mm. Subhanallah. Sidi, <clears throat> I, I'm very indebted to your time you've given us. And uh, I was just like to ask you for any closing words or any advice on how to for our readers on how to approach Ibn Arabi, those who are yearning to better understand or connect with him, how should they approach him? And also, I think a theme that I've recently found with some friends is in this time, there seems to be a scarcity or a difficulty in finding shuyukh of a certain caliber, as there was 15, 20, 50 years ago. There seemed to be a much more easily, readily available access to, uh, you know, eminent shuyukh of uh, Ehsan. And so what the advice is uh, for those who are seeking uh, truth and a means to the truth? Uh, first of all, when this comes uh, to a person's heart to seek uh, God or to seek this path, it is God who is giving that person permission to come to him. So first you acknowledge that God wants me. God here is the murid and you are the murad. So when this intention comes to a specific person, uh, that person has to seek a spiritual guide who has uh, a faqih, a scholar in sharia, and who has 
completed the path, the spiritual path of self-realization and witnessing God, and has permission to guide others. You only can guide people except if you have permission to guide from God. As the Prophet Muhammad. So a person cannot just come and initiate, okay, I have now been given permission to uh, make a path, a tariqah. This cannot be done. It can only be given. For example, if the Prophet, the person has a, a direct connection to the Prophet Muhammad, and the Prophet Muhammad gives that sheikh permission to guide others, then he or she can make a tariqah. You cannot just invent a tariqah and give it a name, or oh, because I have reached the fat. No one does this. People who do it, but uh, they are non, non authentic. Yeah. Okay. The, the, to guide people, this that's why in Surah Yusuf, this path is the path of the Prophet Muhammad. The end of Surah Yusuf, the verse, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِ Say, this is my path. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ I make da'wah to Allah. عَلَى بصيرة, On an insight. أَنْ وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي So this is the path of the Prophet. It is not the path of Sheikh Abdul Hassan al Shazli or Sidi Abdul Qadir al Jilani, Sidi Ahmed al Rafai, Sidi Ahmed al Badi, Sidi Ahmed al Tijani. It is not their path. They are mere representatives of the Prophet in their time. And they were given permission to guide people to God. So, seeking this Sheikh, if a person cannot find a Sheikh direct, then the shiuch said, a salah on the Prophet Muhammad becomes the sheikh of the spiritual seeker until he or she find an authentic true sheikh. So making salawat on the, on the Prophet Muhammad is the greatest dhikr, okay? A person who is seeking God and seeking to find the truth should adhere to, whether it's the La'il al-Khayrat, Qunuz al-Asrar, a specific salah on the Prophet Muhammad, that person should make salawat on the Prophet Muhammad as much as he or she can until the salah guides through the salah for you to uh, reach that, uh, that sheikh. When you reach that sheikh, this is not the end. Okay, you might be tested. You might see things, worldly things, because the sheikh is human, he's a manifestation, he's a creation. Okay? You might doubt, oh, how did this sheikh do You are being tested here. Similar to what Al-Khidr said to Moses, you cannot have patience. And then he explained, how can you have patience when you cannot <laughs> totally understand what's going on? So here the seeker comes to the intention. Your intention was to seek and attain God Ask God to purify your intention and ask him to guide you to him. Mm. Allahumma and only you I want. Keep purifying your intention until God himself takes you to himself. That's why the shiuch also, either, they say, uh, if God leads you to a arif billah, to a alim billah, to a nastik, either awsalaka ila arifin faqad awsalaka ilay. He has led you to himself. But you are still veiled from seeing this. Okay? And when a person follows the sheikh who has direct lineage to the Prophet Muhammad, okay, the silsila, so that person adheres to the chain, to the silsila. And then through spiritual experiences, ahwal and the maqamat, states and stations, a person reaches fat. So you have to adhere to a living sheikh because you will be tested. You might reach the end but the door has not yet opened you might return back why because you uh, the heart is not pure or uh, prepared yet to enter the hadra okay and even if a person reaches the hadra you are still feared upon why because is it the beauty of witnessing you want or is it me mm. you want me or you want the, this beauty okay so it's a test till the end. It's a test till the end, test after test. And passing the test is adhering to God all the time, asking God, okay? 
so I think this is my uh, uh, advice from my uh, experience, which I, I like to uh, uh, share with all of you. And just last question is, those who are seeking a means to better understand Ibn Arabi, to become immersed uh, in the Sheikh Al-Akbar, what, how should they approach the writing? The first thing, uh, if a person wants to read without a Sheikh, um, reading Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Arabi, first you have to read it with a Sheikh. A Sheikh does not mean a scholar in, in fiqh or no. A Sheikh who uh, has attained fatah is عارف بالله ناصدق عالم بالله and then he can he or she can explain to the seeker so you have to accompany a sheikh and a sheikh gives you permission to read the first thing which people might read began reading is the last chapter of the Futuhat and it, you can find it in a separate book it's called Al Wasaya Al Wasaya uh, where Sheikh uh, Muhammad Arabi gives Wasaya uh, 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 to the seeker, spiritual seeker, advice to the speaker, to the uh, seeker of, of God. So to begin with, read al wasai or the last chapter in uh, the Futuhat al makkiyya Then when you find the sheikh, uh, that sheikh, after he gives you permission to read, then you can read the photo, uh, any books of the sheikh. Because as I said, uh, you might misunderstand what he's saying. Like for example, I give example uh, also to my students. Uh, in his diwan, uh, the sheikh says, um, Subhanallah. <laughs> it's gone from my mind. And, uh, Maybe it will come. It will come, yes, inshallah. Yeah. Sidi, on that note, um, often with uh, Orthodox, well, generally people who read him, who, who don't understand Ibn Arabi, or come with a certain mindset, which is already conditioned, he either gets misunderstood, or like you said earlier on, uh, labeled as a heretic, or uh, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's too difficult. It's too difficult uh, to to read. So, why? What is it? Do you think in the Sheikh Al Akbar's teachings or the way he explains that people call him a heretic or find him difficult, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? <laughs> it came to me now. I remember. There you now. go. I knew. So, I for knew example, it. <laughs> you said okay. So, a person can you can call him a heretic when he reads this. For example, Sheikh Mahdi Abi said. So he is mentioned person is oh by mentioning God, making dhikr. My sins are increased. And the hearts and the insights are blackened. And leaving dhikr is better. <laughs> because the sun does not set. So someone reads this, look, he's a heretic. He is speaking about something else. He is speaking a person who's mentioning dhikr. What is the goal of, is it you mentioning God or is it God mentioning himself on you? He has given you permission to mention him. So you are men making dhikr, but you think that you are mentioning God, okay? You are mentioning God. What is the goal of dhikr? Ana, there's a hadith, the Prophet Muhammad mentioned this hadith, Qudusi, Ana jalisu man dhakarani. I am seated <laughs> with those who are mentioning me. Ana jalisu man dhakarani. So mentioning God, you keep mentioning him in order you Witness him by the veil should the veil should be lifted and by God's permission, the heart the veils on your heart are, are lifted so you can witness God. Okay, so Sidi Muhammad Arabi is speaking about this. Like for example, you're in front of uh, an apartment door or uh, uh, you want to enter. The door is closed. You keep knocking on the door. So this is like Dick. I'm knocking. Allah, 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 Allah. 
you're mentioning this, but the door is not open. Okay, so you keep mentioning until it opens. So the door opens. What do you do? You still stand outside and keep knocking, or you enter. Mm. So dhikr is a path to entering the presence of God. So he says here, we understand now from this uh, poem, okay? So if the door opens and you keep on knocking on the door, your insight and heart are black and you cannot see. Enter the present. You stop mentioning dhikr and witness God. So here it's a sin, making dhikr while you're inside in the hadra, you don't have any sight. So that's why leave the why? Because the sun, the presence of God, never sets down. That is why a person needs a sheikh, a Arif Billah, a Gnostic who has reached and understands what the other Gnostic is trying to say. Hmm. Okay. So, so this was the example I wanted to give. Oh, perfect. So, so Sidi, d- just on that note, there was, uh, I believe there's various stations uh, Sheikh Muhyiddin mentions, then he talks about abandoning those stations. Dark. <laughs> yes. So this is essentially yes. going from the duality perspective to the non-duality. So having yes, to akul, then the abandoning, the, and then abandoning yes. to akul. Yes. Yes, you, you become the, the tool. And no one knows the soldiers of God except himself. Hmm. And this is present, for example, in the prophet Abraham, when he was thrown into the pit of fire and the angel Gabriel came and asked him, uh, Do you want something from God? He said, عِلْمُهُ بِحَالِي يُغْنِينِي عَنْ سُؤَالِ him knowing my state uh, is better than uh, and, and knows more than me asking him. Mm-hmm. So you become the tool. Every, he puts you here, takes you there. Okay. Uh, also, I said, Al Khidr, uh, when he uh, broke in the ship and he killed the young boy and built the wall, he said, Wama fa'altuhu an amri. I did not do it on my own accord. Okay. Also, from this, um, uh, so those God, yes, people say yeah, he takes the spirit from the body, but what about Akbara? He is burying him. So he's doing the burying. <laughs> so, so religion, the rituals in religion are merely corridors, pathways. In realizing and reaching this goal, and this goal is La ilaha illallah. There are no gods except Allah. And also, I interpreted this and I mentioned it also in my book and in my thesis La ilaha illallah from the Akbarian perspective, from the Arif Billah, from the Gnostic perspective. If you, for example, witness someone uh, in Hinduism, for example, prostrating down to a cow. I'm not saying this is the Islamic path, but for the Gnostic, the Gnostic is witnessing Allah worshipping himself through this means. But this means, I'm not saying this is all paths lead to God as people misunderstood Ibn Arabi and say all the religions lead to one thing. No, it is for the Gnostic. Any deity that is being worshipped on earth, la ilaha, it's Allah himself, but you cannot see it. So then what is shirk in Ibn Arabi's perspective? <laughs> shirk is veiled. Veiled. Right. That's why the Prophet Muhammad, you have to relate it to Sharia. That's why the Prophet Muhammad said, al-shirk al-khafi. It's called the veiled shirk, that you see yourself benefiting yourself, doing this action. Yourself, you chose it. I did not choose it. You are veiled. This, this is shirk. You benefit yourself. You benefit others. Hmm. It is only God who is manifesting in this form using this form to benefit others. So people are veiled, not seeing God. They are seeing themselves. That's why many pa- people in the paths, in the Torah, in the Sufi, are veiled by their shiuch from seeing Allah. Mm. They are so uh, 
immersed and attached to their paths, Sufi paths, and their shiuch more than Allah. Hmm. And by their good That's works. That's Their good works. Yes. Everything. This is shirk. Shirk al-Khafi as the Prophet Muhammad. This is shirk al-Khafi. Hmm. Okay? And there are many hadiths uh, talk about this. Also, it's mentioned in the Salah al-Mashishiyah by Sidi Abdul Salam ibn Mashish when he says in the Salah al-Mashishiyah, وَجْعَلْ الْحِجَابَ الْأَعْظَمْ And make the greatest veil, okay? The greatest veil here is the Prophet Muhammad. People are sometimes veiled by the beauty and perfection of the Prophet Muhammad from seeing Allah. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُبَيُعُونَكَ إِنَّمَا يُبَيُعُونَ اللَّهِ يَدُ اللَّهِ فَوْقَ أَيْدِينَ Those who make an oath of allegiance with you are making an oath of allegiance with Allah. So a, pe- a person can be veiled, as I said, by his, by his or her good actions, his good, uh, deeds, can be, be veiled by the uh, sheikh of the tariqah, can be veiled by the Prophet Muhammad. The Prophet Muhammad is the path for reaching Allah. Okay? Mm-hmm. Then that Gnostic becomes the perfect manifestation of the Muhammadian reality in seeing God. So it's only the Muhammadian light that sees and witnesses God. So God manifests himself on the Nur al-Muhammadi. Okay, it's not even the Gnostic. Okay, it's the Nur al-Muhammadi that witnesses and sees, sees God. God sees himself through this man- first manifestation, the first emanation, the Muhammadian light. Hmm. Then this principle of إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي yes. أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليم الله and yeah. the angels send their salutations praise on the prophet yeah. could you explain that then in the Ibn Arabi's uh, perspective and also when you mentioned the Darud if, it, if there is a seeker who hasn't found a shaykh they're making salawat obviously there's a big uh, emphasis on this action of making yeah. salawat al nabi but also Allah making salawat on the Nabi and exactly. the angels making salawat yes. on the Nabi. So what's going yes. on here? What is this uh, okay. mysterious <laughs> dynamic? The Prophet Muhammad, he said, as salatu alayya nur. Salah on me is light. So what is the use of light? It shows you. It's the path that shows you. So there are three levels. Also again, in the salawat on the Prophet. So there is the salah commanded, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. Did he say the Muslims? He did not say the Muslims. Even though the Muslimun make salutations of the Prophet in their salah, even if they don't like it, <laughs> in the tahiyyat. But only the Mu'minun who are given, commanded by God to make salah on him. Okay? So the first, for all creation, to make salah on him. The second is the Hakikah al muhammadiyah Prophet Muhammad making salutations on, on himself. The Nur al-Muhammad is making salawat on himself. And then finally, Allah is making salawat on the Prophet. So there are three levels also of ma'rifa. The first, the mu'minun making salawat on him. So I see myself as a mu'min and making salawat on the Prophet. Then when a person transcends, he becomes or she becomes and realizes the Muhammadian light, it is Muhammad making salawat on himself. Okay? And this is mentioned, okay? He, didn't he mention make the tahiyat on himself? Assalamu alaikum, ayyuhal And when he entered the mosque, <laughs> he's making salat on himself so this is another level the third level is the state of annihilation when Allah is making salawat on the first manifestation or the first emanation on that Muhammadian light uh, the scholars have explained it that uh, the mu'minun are making dua supplications on the Prophet, the angels uh, are, uh, are making praise to increase the level of the stations of the Prophet Muhammad, and Allah is praising that Muhammadian light, or he's praising his first emanation of, of light, which made 
all creation appear because all creation, as Sidi Muhammad ibn Arabi says, at uh, the first uh, creation, are inside the knowledge of God. And in order for them to appear, God sheds the first emanation of his light, at nur the nur of the Prophet Muhammad, and made everything in existence appear through that light. For example, you have a room plenty with uh, furniture, but the room's dark. So creation is like the furniture inside this room. It exists. Or al okay? So you have a desk, you have a bed, you have a cabinet. It's there, but you cannot see it because it's dark. It's immersed in darkness and the knowledge of God. So how do I make it appear? By switching on the light, uh, switching on the light. So this light is the Muhammadian light, which made everything in existence appear. Yeah. Sidi, could you say something about uh, Sheikh Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi's approach to, I don't want to use the word interpretation, but his approach to understanding the Quran and Hadith. Needless to say, yes. one of the things that I just want to add that really drew me to Ibn Arabi was nearly on every second line, there's a Quran or Hadith. Uh, yeah, exactly. you know, every, every, again and yes. again. But he's able to take the literal meaning or the vowels or the grammatical nuances and extrapolate the highest metaphysical truths or esoteric meanings within the exoteric. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. <laughs> he does that again and again yes. and again. Yes. And so he never deviates from the literal. Uh, he never says, this is the only inter you know, perspective, uh, yeah. and it is this. But he somehow is so encompassing. It's very, it's very merciful, his whole approach to his old perspective. Uh, and the, the example that comes to mind is from Surah Baqarah, where uh, the verse on um, the, kafir, the, the, the kafirs are summum bukmum umyum for whom liars you own. Yes. Allah has sealed their hearing and sight, mm. etc. And so Ibn Arabi is saying that these are not just literally the kafirs, but also yes. the highest state of the awliya who kafara, as in they've covered their station yes. from people. Yes, and Balamatea, yes. Yes, yes. And, and no matter what you do, you, you can't preach to them because they see and hear nothing. Allah has put their stamp on, on their exactly. heart. See, they see nothing exactly. but God. So this is he, it, yes. Yes. How does he, where does he take this from? Has he, has he learned this from, is this done before him? And what, I mean, it's a really amazing, you know, uh, approach he has to take the literal yet uh, he's more literal than a literalist in, ma in many ways exactly yet okay he, he has the highest universal metaphysical truth within that literalism i mean it's really amazing um the more you get mm -hmm. into it so could you say something about that please yes uh, see the muhyiddin allah one of the names of allah is the apparent and he's the inner he's a zahir and al batin so the Quran, people read it from the apparent, from the Zahr perspective. But it has a hidden, an inner side, inner perspective. Why? Because it's a manifestation. It's the Kalamullah, the literal word of God. So it has many meanings. That's why Sidi Muhyiddin, he mentioned, he said, if you want to uh, open the different meanings of the Quran, and all of these meanings are correct, you must approach it through the language, decipher the language of Arabic, which God chose to be the language of the Quran. So deciphering, so for, for example, if you interpret a particular word and examine it, its root, its it, uh, etymology, every meaning that comes out from the Arabic analysis and examination of the words is correct. So you are not inputting meanings of your uh, beliefs on the scripture, 
as we see many people, okay, uh, or many scholars, and also some scholars, for example, um, make an uh, uh, not an interpretation, an explanation of the Quran, tafsir from different perspectives, for like Zamakhshari from the grammatical perspective. But Sidi Muhyiddin said, if you interpret the Quran from the uh, perspective of language and the roots of every words, every meaning is correct. And every meaning is intended by God. So you have endless meanings, all but only through the perspective of the Quran. Also, Ibn Arabi was not, as I said, not the first to speak about Tawheed or oneness of being or this concept of examining, analyzing the uh, Quran or, in, or interpreting it, but people, many uh, awliya and many uh, scholars before him. And you can read this, for example, uh, something that comes uh, to my mind, uh, Sheikh Abdul Hassan al-Shadri, when he in, explained or interpreted, وَقَاتِلُوا الَّذِينَ يَلُونَكُمْ مِنَ الْكُفَّارِ وَلِيَجِدُوا فِيكُمْ غِرَّةً So he, he said, uh, yes, it's, it, it has both an exterior in explanation and an interior interpretation. So, Sheikh Sidi Abul Hassan al he said, uh, those who are close to you from the kuffar or the covert is your nafs. Is your nafs. Mm -hmm. So, it is the correct meaning, okay? As long as it is within the boundaries of Arabic, the Arabic language of the, of the Quran. And as you said, kuffar here comes from the word to cover, cover something up. So, uh, also, I remember uh, something, uh, Al-Hallaj, it's like a form of shathiyat, when he said, كَفَرْتُ بِدِينِ اللَّهِ وَالْكُفْرُ وَاجِبُ لَدَيَّ وَعِنْدَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ قَبِيعِ He's speaking about something else. كَفَرْتُ بِدِينِ اللَّهِ I covered my beliefs on one, about oneness of God, okay? And kufr here from the sense is, uh, uh, understood by the general Muslims or the majority of Muslims as being heretic. Mm. So, kafar to bidini, I covered and withheld it inside me. <laughs> Super. Sidi, thank you so much. I think I've uh, yeah. you've exhausted my questions. And uh, <laughs> for now, I think, alhamdulillah, for this session, I would like to bring it to a close and I'm very grateful for your time and inshallah, I look forward to many more sessions with you. Thank you very much. It, is, it has been my honor and uh, please, please feel free to contact me anytime you would like. Barakallah,